OJ today. Welcome back, everyone, and happy holidays, of course. All the best to you and your family. Uh, this has become an OJ today tradition over the holidays where we take one show to review both conferences and uh, basically just see what's happened so far since we're uh, now just past the midway point. So to get things started today, we're looking at the Northwest Conference. First, Oakville Blades announcer Nicholas Fiore joins me for that. Nicholas, welcome back, buddy. Thank you very much. Uh, it's a pleasure and honor, and I uh, appreciate it very much. All right, let's roll. You've had a chance to see every team in the conference up close and personal now. Let's start in the north. Uh, a dogfight between Collingwood and Stouffville at the top. Uh, the Spirit have been a great story so far, having missed the playoffs the last three seasons, and they'll definitely be there this year, and they could make some serious noise, couldn't they? Well, they have Damon Beaver backstopping them. He's been terrific this season. Um, earlier on in the campaign, they tied the Oakville Blades 2-2 two to two in a thrilling game all the way to double OT. But they have the caliber in former Blades, Tanner McEachern and Holden Doggett. They have the championship experience uh, to take them all the way. And who knows, they could be the team that's coming out of the North. Yeah, and it's a great first year, great first year for the Collingwood Colts, of course. Uh, first year franchise, big crowds at Eddie Bush Arena. They've really embraced that squad up in Collingwood and they've iced a competitive squad who scored some big wins, haven't they? Well, Adrian Neighbors, he's, he's the captain. He's been really leading the way um, all over the ice surface, to be honest. There's Patrick Brown there as well, but it's something with Collingwood, their home. It's, it's like a little, it's a small barn, it's yeah. a fortress. They play tight, they play tight knit, and they really use the small barn to their advantage. They do. I just the great crowds, great atmosphere. They've really done a great job up in Collingwood. Uh, let's move on to the Pickering Panthers now, who in heartbreaking fashion, of course, missed the playoffs last year. They lost to Georgetown in the Northwest crossover game. Uh, but guys like Rocco Andriacci have uh, been having great season. Overall, Pickering's a, a good team, and they could be uh, moving up a couple more spots, I think, throughout the year as well. Do you agree? They could be the dark horse in yeah. the in that North Division. They just acquired Shane and Noah Bull from the Corpus Christi Ice Rays in the NHL. And Darachi has been fantastic, the former Brampton Admiral. They've they're slowly putting the pieces together. They got experience now with the Bull brothers. Uh, the coach behind the bench is experienced as well, all coming from Whippy Theory last year. So Pickering could be the team to to watch out and they might creep up in the north. Well, Markham has been all over the map so far. Flashes of brilliance, but uh, inconsistent as well. What's been your take on the Royals so far? Uh, well, a few er, earlier on in the season, the Oakville Blades, of course, I was there, and the Markham Royals were up 3 nothing, and it just, the wagon, the wheels fell off the wagon. The Oakville Blades put some wins together. Newly acquired forward Jake Very scored his first goal, and the Blades ended up winning 4-3. to three. I don't know if they're if they're fully collecting, playing collectively as a unit right now. They have such good pieces. They have uh, Amedo Mastrarelli, uh, Bonaiuto, Zach Serrato, who's been there for a few years. They have players who can play. It's just, can they come in full circle and, and play as a unit and really take it to the next level? Because the Blades and the Royals were in the conference final last year and yeah. Blades won four games to one, but now can Markham just put some pieces together and take it further up? And that's going to be the challenge. And that game was just a backbreaker for the Royals, wasn't it? Games like that can really turn your season around up 3 nothing, And then, of course, you can't let up for a second against Oakville, as you very well know. Um, let's move on to uh, Aurora. To put it mildly, it's been a tough season in Aurora. The Tigers, uh, along with the Lindsay Muskies, have had the worst record in the OJ this season. Uh, for you, what's been the problem for Aurora thus far? I think it's the, the gravitational pull. The player pool. Um, you have a, a large cities in, in the GTA. You got Brampton, Brampton's large, Oakville's large, but it's the consistent winning basis that you have to try to build. They have their wins, 
they have their Buckland Cubs, but it's you go from a fortress of the jungle to be one year. Um, you have the dark eye as your head scout. You got everything going well, and then it just sinks down the other year because you lose certain amount of pieces. You could just see it's not it's not clicking for them. I think it will click uh, over the years for both teams, but for Aurora right now, it's 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 tough going in the jungle. It is, and they never seem to recover from last year. Remember, of course, they were pretty much the top team in the OJ for a while at the beginning of last season, and then from about mid December onwards, they were actually the worst team. They had the worst winning percentage. They fell way off in the north down to what they they ended up barely making the playoffs. Action, of course, got blown out in the first round. One more question for you about the North before we have a break. We've got about a minute here, Nicholas, and that is Collingwood Stouffville on top right now. Who's your pick to come out first place in the North? Stouffville spirit. Um, it's as simple as two former Oakville blades are there. Tanner McKecker and Holden Dog, and I mentioned it earlier on, but the experience going all the way to the national tournament, Tanner scoring in the national tournament in one of the group stage games. Holden Doggett, that pesky, the, wrist, the, the guy who goes into the corners will get the puck for the likes of Captain Connor May. Um, they play well at their home bar in Stovall Arena. Very well. They're a collective unit. You can see it on uh, on and off the ice, especially on social media. They're very tight-knit. Um, I know the Blades miss Holden and Tanner, yeah. but I think Stovall is, is coming out of the north. And of course, outstanding goaltending before by Damon Beaver, who's been a fixture in our weekly top five with some of his saves. Uh, we're running out of time for this segment. When we come back, we're going to have a chat about the West Division. More OJ Today coming up in just a moment. This portion of the OJ Today is brought to you by Q Caller, official safety partner of the Ontario Junior Hockey League. Hey, welcome back to the OGA Today. I continue to be joined by the voice of the Oakville Blades, Nicholas Fiore, as we review the Northwest Conference so far this season. Uh, and let's get to your Oakville Blades then, defending Buckland Cup champions, and they're looking uh, really strong against this year, aren't they? Well, yeah, they sure are. Um, they're, they're continuing to put the wins together. A bit of a rough patch, uh, losing to Brantford a couple of times earlier on. Um, in overtime, double overtime, two seconds left, and then again, 5-1, their biggest defeat since November 30th of 2017 when Milton was the Newmarket Hurricanes, 8-1, to two seasons ago, my first year with the Blades. Um, Oakville is led by Harrison Israels, backstop by Will Barber, Jack Ricketts is on a mission as well. They just got a newly acquired four from the Chilliwack Chiefs in the BCHL, Jake Vary, who already has three points in a few games played. And Oakville, they're putting it together. Uh, once uh, O'Hara comes back from Team Canada East, uh, who, who they just won the, the silver medal against Rush Up, yep. um, they're gonna they're gonna put it together. The Oakville Blades, uh, everyone, not because I'm there, but <laughs> everyone's got to watch out on and off the ice. They're a brotherhood. Yeah, they're playing well. Their skill yeah. is undeniable, and they can go far. And again, a ton of commitments of Jack Lyons, of course, just signing with Kanisha. So love to see yeah. that. Always advancing guys to the next level. Yeah, the Blades have been neck and neck with the Burlington Cougars all year long. A true battle of Halton region. A ton of balance on this team. This is a squad you see a lot of in the West. Tell us about Burlington. Well, they have the likes of Janini, Cotta, Morrison, McVeigh, the former Whitby Fury, leading the way uh, on the points, on the tat, on the stat sheet. But they're well coached by uh, Mark Juris, who was a Burlington Cougar before, um, came back. And you can see the structure is very good in Burlington. Uh, neck and neck with the Blades. I can see them as the second round in the uh, OJHL playoffs. And then I would say that team then will come out of the Northwest Conference. Yeah, well, the Buffalo Junior Sabres had uh, kind of a weird start to the year where they got absolutely smoked more than once. Uh, Burlington beating them 10 nothing. just one example of that. But they've really gotten it together over the last couple of months. What's been your take on the Americans? Buffalo right now, they're, they're putting it together. Uh, they started uh, weak, but 14 out of the last 17 one game until the Christmas break, and they've really been leaning on Nate Burke and Matteo Costantini, Alex Cicero, who just committed as well in CAA Division I. Um, they have some veterans now. Jacob Berger is back, as a few guys were looking to play elsewhere. They came back to the Junior Safe organization. They're slowly now trying to put it together. And I think Buffalo, I don't know if you want to meet them in the playoffs, because 
they're playing as a unit right now, and and they could they could be a force to be reckoned with in the West. They could, and it's like those two blowout wins though had everyone shaking their head, thinking it was going to be a long year in Buffalo, but they've really righted the ship and they're doing well now. Let's move to Georgetown. I feel this is one of the most underrated teams, one of the more dangerous teams in the OJ this year. You can't take them lightly. Their offense, of course, has not been good, although they've started to pick it up lately. Uh, but they've had incredible goaltending from Nathan Torquia and wins thus far over Wellington, Stouffville, Oakville, and now Burlington twice. What's your read on Georgetown? They're the dark horse in the West, but they find the way to get the job done. They put the pucks in the net, they're grinding. Torquia is absolutely terrific. You know, he plays in the OHL a few games called up, I believe, with the Kitchener Rangers. And they're going through a bit of a minor rebuild. Yeah. They're, they lost a lot of guys from last year, um, but they're leaving on Condotta, Houston, Torquia. He just stops everything. He covers the entire net. How are you yeah. going to score for them, right? Yeah. But Georgetown, they're, they're a good team. Brantford, a tough team to read. I, I find some significant major junior experience, of course, in Kyle Ballers and Jacob Ball. Good goaltending, uh, but they've mostly sort of been stuck in that fifth spot yeah. in the West. What's the story with the 99ers? The Oakville Blades beat them the first two games of the regular season, and you thought, okay, is it another season, a lonely season in Brantford? But they're like, nope, I don't think so. Dan Fitzpatrick's leading the way uh, behind the bench. 7-0 and after the first 0-2 games, and now they've been split back and forth. But they got two victories in the last couple of weeks against the Oakville Blades. They're putting wins together. Um, bowlers, he played with Israels and Ricketts of the Oakville Blades at the All-Star Celebration, and you can see the connection there. You can see three good players coming together. If Brantford makes some moves and get players to play alongside Ballers, and they keep on rolling, Brantford could maybe not, I don't know, move on, but they could win some games in the postseason against some higher-ranked teams in the West, like Burlington or Oakville. They are a very dangerous team, and exactly you mentioned Kyle Ballers, of course, OJHL All-Star, uh, brings it every single game. Very dangerous player. Finally, the Milton Menace. I'm a little shocked when I look at the standings and I see them a distant sixth uh, in the West. C.J. Clark, a great pickup from the Mississauga Steelheads. Uh, Stock has been great. Uh, for them as well. Overall, young team uh, that you can say as well. And uh, Aiden Hughes, of course, a bright future for this squad, though, wouldn't you say? I, I do believe so. Um, I've, I've been to Milton a few times now this season, broadcasted every game against the Menace and the Blades. And just uh, not too long ago, the Oakville Blades were down 2-0. Uh, they were down 3-1. They found a way to come back and win 5-3, led by Israel's four points and Jack Ricketts' two goals. But the Milton Menace, they... Again, a small barn, but they know how to play with each other. Remember, a newly relocated franchise from Newmarket to Milton, new ownership, new coach. They change coaches midway through the season. They have two very good assistant coaches, one and I know personally, and Jeff Angelides from the Brampton Bombers, Junior Canadians, and now with the Milton Menace. They have the right people in place. They got some OHL experience as well in Carter Tack and Net, CJ Clark. So if these players stick around years and years to come, and they grow and they develop, Milton could be maybe a middle-ranked team and then push a few years later to a higher-ranked team in the West Division. Yeah, and uh, great crowd support as well. It's got to be mentioned, of yeah. course, a lot of excitement in Milton uh, with that new franchise coming in. Love the unis too, by the way. Great. Uh, yeah. Love the gray. Um, yeah, we're just about out of time, but got to say it to you, my friend. Have a very uh, Merry Christmas. Happy holidays to you and your family, and uh, we will have you on again in the new year. Thank you. Merry Christmas. Happy holidays to you and uh, everyone watching. I appreciate the opportunity and uh, all the best moving forward. All right. Much appreciated. More OJ Today coming up in just a moment. This segment of the OJ Today is brought to you by Troy Hockey. Troy, the official apparel provider to the OJHL. Hey, welcome back to the OJ Today, and we continue our mid-season holiday review now. Joining me is the host and play-by-play -play man for the OJHL Game of the Week on CHCH Television, Alex Bloomfield. Alex, welcome back, my friend. Thank you for having me on once again. Love it. Love being once a part of again. Show. We never let you sleep. It's just a constant <laughs> thing, I know. Right. Uh, Nicholas Fiore just helped me with the uh, Northwest Conference. You're on the hook for the Southeast and let's start out uh, with the East Division. It's been a struggle at the top all season long between the Trenton Golden Hawks and the Wellington Dukes. Let's start with the Hawks. After two quick playoff exits the last two seasons, 
Uh, they look dangerous this time around, don't they? Yeah, uh, do they ever, I'd say. Yeah, this Trent and Wellington battle is really interesting. You call this struggle as this an epic struggle, I guess, between one of the two of the best teams in the league. Sam Duchesne for the Golden Hawks, I think he's the one to point out. Uh, he's been the, are the best defensive scoring player in the league. Uh, he's the only one really in the top 25 in scoring as a defenseman right now. Uh, Andrew Saria, the great pickup as well for Trenton in October there. They got him from Collingwood, and that really supplemented their top line scoring as well. They were with Griffin Fox, so they've been good. Uh, their goaltending duo, which is actually different from a lot of the top teams this year that are going with a single guy more than a duo. They've got uh, Oberoi and Troop splitting time in Trent, and that's been pretty solid. And, and the best special teams in the league, I think uh, everyone would agree with that. Number one penalty kill, number two power play. So uh, Trent has been pretty deadly there. If they have a weakness, it's defensive depth. Uh, but uh, yeah, the second round in the East is going to be a barn burner. I'm always shocked when someone manages to get the puck past Oliver Troop at six foot six and two, 606 and 230 pounds or whatever it is. He just takes up the entire net. But I uh, know you're right. Great goaltending this year. Uh, the Wellington Dukes continue to live up to the standard they've set as an elite OJ club over the past few years. Uh, Four-game losing streak recently, though, which was by far their worst stretch of the year. But they appear to be back on track. And what have you liked about Wellington? Yeah, it was a bit odd, wasn't it? That that yeah. little brief losing skit they had there. Uh, it began with a loss to Coburg. That was their first loss in the Dukedom all season long. Their only one uh, up until the midway point of December. Uh, they ended a 16-game unbeaten streak, and then they went on that four-game skid. So, I mean, I think they're going to come out of it okay. Uh, when you have a 16-game unbeaten streak, it was a tough Western road trip, basically, where they are going back and forth on a bus to Wellington. That's a lot of travel. Uh, they've added Justin Paul, which makes them even deeper up front when you have Jake Gagnon, Frank Petucci, 1-2 in goals on the same team in the league I uh, really does ridiculous offense for Wellington this year when they come up head-to-head -head against Trenton they're also uh, on the upper hand in the early going three victories in the early going this season there's a couple more coming up in the new year uh, but again I, I don't see anything stopping a Trenton Wellington round two matchup in the east uh, from these teams below them we'll get to in a second yeah it's gonna be fun to watch but let's talk about Coburg for a second here who had a pretty subpar start by their standards anyway which unfortunately cost Jerome Dupont a great head coach uh, his job what's your take on the Cougars so far yeah I think they turned it around a little bit since that point you did have a tough start so they're definitely a more competitive team uh, more I think the better of the two between them and Whitby who they're sort of very close with right now in that East Division standings Thomas Plummer Dave DiMarina is doing a good job taking over there coaching wise uh, big win over Wellington obviously on the uh, on the road there and then a one goal loss to Trenton that followed it up so uh, they, they can hang with the big boys uh, what shot them in the foot a little bit is similar to Wellington trouble with discipline uh, third most time shorthanded Wellington's been the most time shorthanded this year so some some scrappy fellas out east in the early going here not sure if the referees are playing into that at all maybe those teams would protest that but uh really they got to stay out of the box both those guys and i think especially Coburg uh, in doing so if they're going to have success uh fifth worst power play as well so special teams just in general some trouble there for for Coburg. yeah well the whitby fury got younger this year and they're reloading but uh, ethan doyle for example has led them so far uh, they'll be in the mix for possibly that Southeast crossover game if they can't outright win a playoff spot. But like I said, Doyle's been great. Uh, what's your take on Whitby so far? Yeah, really interesting. Uh first couple months of the season for the Whippy Fury team. It started out looking pretty decent. Uh, it cooled off a bit. And you're right, you mentioned Ethan Doyle. He leads the way points-wise. Only guy, though, with over double digits in goals. They really had trouble scoring. Uh, so they made a trade, actually, here in December. And it's a pretty big one, moving uh, Amadeo Mastrangeli for Michael Andrews uh, from the Markham Royals. So their big man on the back end, he was an all-star. He has to throw his body around. He's going away. They're, I think they they're, they need offensive depth. They added the second-line guy in Michael Andrews. He was a point-per-game guy in the GOJ last year. Uh, uh, so now he comes in and hopefully Whitby can bolster their scoring uh, with him and maybe some other pickups uh, because they do need to, their third fewest goals in the conference right now. That's not good enough. And you're right, they're in a dogfight. They got to keep pace with Coburg to try to avoid that fourth spot, which may be a crossover situation. The South has five teams that are solid. So uh, trouble for Whitby Brewing, I think, here as far as where they'll land. Uh, they got to turn it around quickly. They're 0-8 against the top two teams in the division, which I think makes their record look worse than they actually are as a team when you play Trenton and Wellington that many times uh, so it is a bit difficult there but uh, we'll see how it shakes down and talking about lack of offense of course big loss to your pickering panthers uh just a couple weekends ago that seven nothing loss that i think turned some heads not just because uh of whitby getting blown out like that but also pickering showing off its firepower let's move to the lindsey muskies we got about a minute left here alex before commercial i always feel a bit sorry for this squad being stuck in that 
tough East Division, uh, last place by a fair margin right now. What are your thoughts on the Muskies? Yeah, I mean, it's another season of basically the same formula where you start out pretty slow and it stays that way and then you start trading off some older guys as the season goes on. And not a lot of moves as per usual, but they just, we saw the goaltender, Dean Buckholz, get shipped off to uh, the Superior League. Uh, Tucker Firth got sent out to one of their solid defensemen. They're last in goals for, they're last in goals against in the league. I mean, it, they, they're also last in points. Uh, so there's really not much to say. They're not being shortchanged here. You're right, their division um, is tough. So they play a lot of games against Wellington and Trenton. There's not a lot they can do there, but... Uh, Scott Donato and his new regime uh, really taking over there and then Lindsay have some uh, some soul searching to do It's really their first full season sort of getting the reins underneath them figuring out what they can do in Lindsay uh, There are some limitations there, uh, but we'll see how they can uh, I think they're looking forward to next season as far as any real change we see in Lindsay. Yeah, agreed Okay, we're gonna take a quick break and we will continue with Alex Bloomfield more OJ today coming up in just a while. This segment of the OJ Today is brought to you by Scotiabank. Scotiabank, the official bank of the OJHL. Hey, welcome back to the OJ Today. I continue to be joined by Alex Bloomfield as we review the Southeast Conference uh, just past the midway point of the season. We move to the South Division now, and the Toronto Patriots have led the South for most of the season, but they're being pushed big time at the moment by the junior Canadians. Let's discuss the Pats first. It's been a great campaign so far, hasn't it, Alex? Yeah, definitely has. Uh, Mario Pecciel started between the pipes uh, for the Patriots. He's uh, fourth in saves in the entire league. And now that's odd for a team that's that good. That means he's playing a lot of games. So he's really been relied upon for the Patriots. Patriots, though, it's the power play. They're super deadly here, first in the league. Uh, Cole Birch leading the way points-wise, but it's a balanced attack. No one really stands out to you as the one guy or two guys leading this team. They can go uh, one through three with their line scoring-wise. they got seven guys over ten goals. Um, so, yeah, just a solid group up and down the lineup. Yeah, and I'm not sure if people expected uh, the junior Canadians to be this good this quickly, but they've been unreal. They've got some high-end youngsters uh, like Ryan Teverberg to go along with seasoned veterans. It's a club with a legitimate shot to win it all, I think. And uh, do you agree? Yeah, I was a little late getting on to them. I think you were on them before I was. And they yeah. absolutely have proven it that they're they're part of that top six echelon in this league. There's six teams, two atop each of the divisions except for the North, that I think everyone agrees is sort of in this top uh, group that could come out as the league champion as it stands right now. But Matthew Redding, the veteran, sneakily in there. He actually leads the team in points. Um, so he's uh, really had a great year uh, and is, I believe, his fourth now with the Junior Canadians. Um, the big one, though, between, this, between the pipes. I mentioned earlier Christian Mattiacci. Yeah. He's first in wins. He's second in goals against. Uh, he's up there in save percentage. He's first in minutes played in the league uh, for a top team. So uh, I like the addition of Tanner Shepard, actually, the Canadians made uh, at the December 1st deadline from the Pickering Panthers. He's been playing in a starting role, really, for the past year and a half. Now he gets to be a solid backup there to Mattiacci, and they needed that because they, they were relying upon Mattiacci way too much right. in the early going for a team that's going to hopefully have a long playoff run. Right. Well, let's move to the St. Mike's buzzers. Uh, they're right around that 500 mark. But as per usual, they have some of the top young talent in the league. Ayrton Martino, Ryan Alexander being two of them. What's your take on St. Mike's this year? Really interesting team. I got to see them in December. I really liked them. I saw them without their three players. They were a team Canada East, actually. Uh, Martino, Ryan Alexander, and Evan Tanos. Um, and they, they still looked good. Um, so I, I think the St. Michael's Buzzers are a sneaky team. I don't think either the Canadians or the Patriots want to play them in the first round. Uh, I think they could cause some trouble, uh, especially if they have all those players healthy for that first round of the playoffs. St. Mike's again, and they, they do this often, they're the most disciplined team in the league by far. 337 penalty minutes, about 200 less than most teams, and 88 times shorthanded. It's like 30 fewer than the second fewest. Uh, they don't they don't give you power play opportunities, so you got to beat them even strength, and uh, they're, they're a smart team. So I'd say watch out for these guys. Uh, they've also, a lot of them have played together for a couple seasons. The North York Rangers, uh, they knew this would be a rebuilding year after last season's great run that they had. Uh, they've been mostly solid this year. They, they, no one really quite knew what to expect from them, but uh, they've been solid uh, despite a couple of recent blowout losses. Uh, but for example, Cole O'Hara, another youngster uh, leading the team in scoring as a 17-year-old. 
Yeah, it's been the Cole O'Hara show for sure in North York this year. It's a lot of fun. It was Jed Alexander last year. Now it's mm. Cole O'Hara this year. Um, and it, yeah, it's a lot of fun. One of the league's best, I think, regardless of him being 17. Um, yeah, it really drops off from there. They are a little bit short on the depth wise in, in pretty much every position. Eli Schiller hasn't quite filled in uh, for Jed Alexander, though, albeit a much worse team in front of him than Jed had last yeah. year. Um, so yeah, I, I'd say they where they are now is about where they'll likely end up. I think I see them finishing fourth in this division, holding off Mississauga and uh, and and sliding into a playoff spot in the South Division. I don't think there'll be any threat for, <laughs> there won't be any threat for a crossover for that fourth seed in the South no. because of Lindsay in the East not being a threat there to come over. So right. I think they'll be okay where they are. We've got about a minute 30, so let's move it here. Mississauga right there with North York. They'll be battling them uh, for a playoff spot all season. Another team that's had a great performance by a youngster, 16-year-old Matthew Sopp, uh, one of the top scorers on the squad along with uh, Matteo Pacquiao. Yeah, they got off to a good start, the Mississauga Chargers did. Yeah, Sop's been a lot of fun to, to watch, but they're in a familiar position again. Just on the outside looking in, they just can't seem to buy one, the Mississauga Chargers. They've been better the last couple seasons. Uh, again, they're going to be pushing right on the brink here. I think they could force a crossover game in fifth. I think North York will hold them off, but potentially could sneak ahead of Whitby uh, in the other division to force that one game play in. Uh, Mississauga needs to get better on home ice, though. They're 3-9 and nine at home in the early going. They're 500 on the road. Uh, losing Daniel Kuzman, uh, that didn't help when they traded him away to Brantford, but uh, I think they'll be able to, to hang around and potentially force that one game play in. Okay, and quickly, Brampton, they moved to the South Division this year and had a tough go of it so far they sit six but they're a scrappy team they can always surprise you as evidence dropping the patriots two weeks ago what are your thoughts on the admirals we got 30 seconds sorry man yeah, Mississauga has to watch them for sure. They're not far behind as far as uh, sneaking into that fifth spot, and, and they're not they're not out of it. For a team that's last in the division, they have a chance that they can turn things around. Travis Smith, uh, hats off to him between the pipes, third most saves in the league, playing for a last place team, playing against a lot of good teams as well. So he's been under fire, a lot of shots against him. He's been doing very well. Um, yeah, this team, it's tough to put a finger on them. They did beat the Patriots in December. Uh, yeah. They beat North York three times. Uh, if they can do that in the new year again against Mississauga and North York, uh, they could pull off a uh, comeback back into a potential playoff or crossover position uh, in this division. One other final note on this team, the only team not to play an OT game this year for some reason. Most teams have played five, um, none, zero wins or losses. So I think they got to eke out a couple of Bettman points as you call them down the stretch to help out. Absolutely, yeah. Alex, we are out of time. But uh, thank you so much, and of course, uh, Merry Christmas, Happy Holidays to you and your family. You as well. And that's all the time we've got for today. But uh, on behalf of everyone here at the OJ today, have a happy and safe holiday season. And just remember, you can always keep up to date with the league by heading to OJHL.ca, and all of your social media options are right there as well. Thank you for watching. We'll see you next time.